All right, grab your Bibles, and uh, we're going to go to 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter 4. I felt the Lord leading me back to a message that I preached here uh, when I looked back in my files. It was about 12 years ago, and uh, just felt the Lord stirring up some new thoughts about this text and thought that it would be meaningful for us today in our current series. 2 Kings chapter 4, we're going to be reading from verse 38. And Elisha returned to Gilgal. There was a famine in the land. Now the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said to his servant, put on the large pot and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. So one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered from it a lapful of wild gourds and came and sliced them into the pot of stew, though they did not know what they were. Then they served it to the men to eat. Now it happened, as they were eating the stew, that they cried out and said, Man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat it. So he said, then bring some flour. And he put it into the pot and said, serve it to the people that they may eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. So someone comes along and uh, threw some wild gourds into Elijah's stew, and the stew became deadly. Now, we're not sure exactly what these gourds are. The Hebrew word is pokal, and uh, it actually refers to a fruit like a cucumber, but it's translated gourd here because gourds are not really for eating, and they're extremely bitter if you do, and in this instance, this wild gourd, they are deadly. Today, I want to continue the series I started last week called Subtle Strategies, Silent but Deadly deadly Attacks of the Enemy. Now, you might say, what does this story have to do with an attack of the enemy? Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had someone come along and throw wild gourds into your stew? So in Psalm 23... Verse 5, it says that God has prepared a table before us, even in the presence of our enemies, and uh, he causes our cup to run over. Just as Elijah prepared a meal for his disciples, I want, I want us to see him as a type of our heavenly Father who prepares a meal before, for us, even in the presence of our enemy. Now, the enemy can't stop God from preparing a good table for you. But what he can do is he can poison it. And the enemy will often bring people to our table with a lap full of wild gourds to make what God meant for good into something evil. Now, perhaps up to this point in your life, you have been blessed with good things. I mean, God has given you a, a good table, and he's, and he's prepared on your table this, this stew of blessing, and, and in this stew is a mixture of so many good things. Maybe you have a good career, you have a good marriage, you have a good family, you have a, a good ministry in the church, just so many good things that you have in this stew of life. But at some point, someone came along, and they did something to you, or something happened to you, And now there is poison in the pot. Now, because of what someone has done in in those good things that God has given you, now you're drinking in bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness and, and even hatred. And so today, I want to talk to you about this subtle strategy of the enemy, eating from deadly stew. Everybody say, eating from deadly stew. It's tragic that a lot of people today are eating from from deadly stew. 
They seem to be moving through life without a care in the world. they got a smile on their face. Outwardly, they look great. Ask, you, ask them how they're doing. They say, I'm doing, doing awesome, right? But inwardly, many people are suffering more than, than we realize. Smile on the outside, but inside, they're full of hurt. They're carrying offense. There's an anger. There's a bitterness. There's a resentment. There's a poison in the pot. You look at their life. It seems like they have a good marriage, a good family, a good career, all these good things in their life. But really, inside, there's poison in the pot. Now, I don't know who you might be today, what you might be struggling with, battling with, perhaps the bitter herbs, the wild gourd that's been thrown into your stew came in the form of an offense that was committed against you or some form of abuse or mistreatment that you suffered earlier in life. Or maybe those gourds that are in your stew were thrown in there by a spouse. Your marriage, which once was good and full of trust, has turned sour and toxic and abusive. Perhaps it has nothing to do with people. Maybe it's just circumstances that you're facing in your life. Some loss or, or some tragedy. And, and now there's an, an anger towards God. A bitterness towards God. A feeling of betrayal that God has somehow let you down. Whatever the case... You're here today, and you find yourself unable to rid yourself of this bitterness, this, this unforgiveness. There's poison in the pot. What God has meant for good, the enemy has managed to come in and turn it around and try to twist it and make it toxic for evil purposes. And so every day you find yourself returning to that stew, to that pot full of poison and drinking it in, and, and you rehearse it over and over again. How could he have done that to me. I, I trusted him. I relied on him. We were friends. We were comrades. And, and you're drinking in that poison of bitterness, rehearsing how he talked about you or let you down or betrayed you. Or, or maybe you're saying, I, I, I trusted her. How could she turn against me? How could she build a consensus against me? How could she turn so many other people against me, right? And rehearsing all of those details and all of the things that, that she did to you. And you're just drinking in another spoonful. Or maybe it's someone in the church, my pastor disappointed me, or the deacons didn't contact me, or my friend let me down, or maybe it's at work, my boss insulted me, or a co-worker betrayed me. And with each recall of the offense, with each rehearsal of the hurt and the abuse, we're feeding on that poison day after day after day. Bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness just continues to be absorbed into our system because we go back to that deadly stew and we just keep eating from the poison in the pot. There's an example of this in the Old Testament in Job's wife. Many of us are familiar with the story of Job. Job's wife had bitter herbs. She had these toxic gourds thrown into her stew. Now her life was filled with blessing. God had prepared for her an incredible table of blessing, just a stew of all kinds of good things, a godly husband who was wealthy, who was successful, 10 children, right, who were, who were healthy and, and doing well, and they had livestock, and they had, they had flocks and herds and all kinds of blessing and lands, right? I mean, they were just wealthy and prosperous, just a wonderful table that the Lord had presented for them until one day... Job's wife and Job received news of a tragedy in the first chapter of Job. Sabian raiders came and stole their cattle. The fire of God came and consumed their flocks. The Chaldeans killed their servants. All ten of their children were killed in a violent windstorm. Her husband, Job's wife, her husband, Job, was overcome by disease and had these painful boils. And so here's Job's wife standing before the ten caskets of her children with her sick husband next to her. They lost everything. They lost their wealth. They lost their business. They lost their career. And it's those, as though someone came by and threw a lap full of bitter gourds into the good stew of her life. And anger and bitterness and resentment began to take hold of her and poison her soul. And instead of seeking a cure, like Elijah's disciples brought the stew to Elijah and he was able to neutralize the poison, instead of her doing that, she consumed that poison. She kept eating from that 
deadly stew. She kept rehearsing how she had been mistreated and how she had been victimized and everything that happened to her. How could God let this happen to us? We serve him faithfully and this is what we get. She takes in another spoonful of that bitterness. I hate those people who attacked us, those raiders who stole our our flocks. How could they do this to us? We didn't deserve this as she takes in another spoon of that poison. My life is over, full of misery. Nothing good ever happens to me. God has let me down, just taking in more and more of that stew. The poison in her soul took her over. Her heart became hard. Her spirit became toxic until all she could say in Job 2.9 is look at her husband and say to Job, why do you retain your integrity? Curse God and die. The harsh reality is this, church, that in this life, we will have hardships. Amen. There will be losses. There will be tragedy. There will be trauma. There will... Things happen to us that we pray against and we don't want to see, but, but yet because we live in a broken world with broken people, things happen to us. Jesus said in John 16, he said, in this world you will have tribulation. The question is, how will you respond when that tribulation comes? Will you bring it to the Lord like Elijah's disciples? Will you bring it to the Lord and let him add into your life what you need to neutralize that toxic poison? Or, like Job's wife, will you just keep eating it, keep rehearsing it, keep recalling all of the details of what happened to you, drinking in the poison? If you do that, if you do that, Like they said to Elijah, it will be death in your life. There will be several ways that you will see this poison, this toxicity manifest in your life. Let me give you a couple of them. First of all, it will bring death to you spiritually. If you allow bitterness and resentment to just fester in the stew of your life, Holding on to anger and unforgiveness will hinder your walk with God. Let me show you a scripture, Matthew 5, 23. Jesus said, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Did you get that? That's Jesus talking there. He's basically telling us that God is not going to hear our prayers if we are harboring resentment against others. That our fellowship with God is hindered when we do that. That a, that a darkness can settle over our lives, over our spirit. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 9, it says, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother, so he who says that he's in Christ, that he's in the light of God, but hates his brother, is in darkness. He's in darkness. If you keep eating from that deadly stew, it turns into a a form of, of, of hatred towards others, and it brings us under a darkness. We become negative. We become cynical. We become hard hearted. No longer are we under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Instead, we are under the influence of our enemy who wants to see that anger and that hatred and that resentment. So it'll be death to us spiritually. And then it'll be death to us emotionally if we continue to eat that deadly stew. Emotionally. All we can think about, and some of you know what I'm talking about, all we can think about are those bitter herbs that are in our pot. All we can think about is the the offense. We become obsessed, not with Jesus, not with the goodness of God. We become obsessed with the hurt with the loss, with the offense, with the pain. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul refers to those who are obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy and strife and reviling and evil suspicions. We forget about all of the good things that God has blessed us with. 
our family, our children, our, our home, our career, our ministry, our church. And all we can think about is that negative. All we can think about is that offense, how we were wronged. And it consumes our mind. All day long, we're dwelling on it. We're home with our family instead of enjoying our, our, our kids, enjoying our, our dinner, enjoying our, our spouse. We're still in the back of our mind is, is, the, is the, the recall of what somebody did to us. We go to bed at night. We, it's the last thing that we're thinking about while we're lying in bed before we go to sleep. And even in our sleep, it invades us and gets into our dreams and we dream about that person. Anybody know what I'm talking about? No, come on, you're too holy, right? I know, you never, right? It invades our dreams. And then as soon as you wake up in the morning, your eyes open up. What's the first thing that you think about, right? The wild gourd that's in the stew, the bitter herb, right? And eventually, depression takes over, anxiety takes over. One study was done that, that, that revealed 33% of Americans have a depressive disorder and that 43% of Americans struggle with an anxiety disorder. Americans, we're the most prosperous people in the world. Amen, right? The most stable economy, the most secure. With, we, we, we are the greatest country as far as standard of living goes, but yet in the midst of that standard of living, what do we have? We have wild gourds in our stew. 33% of people struggling with depression. 43% of people struggling with anxiety. Why is that? Because they're eating from deadly stew. Unforgiveness, anger, bitterness, resentment. So it'll bring death to us spiritually, death to us emotionally, and then it'll bring death to other relationships. Relationally, there will be death, especially in our family. We become Difficult people to live with. We become hard to love. Everybody say hard to love. Hard to love. The smallest offense, right, short fuse. The smallest offense just turns us, turns us into angry monsters, right? Child spills the juice or the spouse says the wrong thing. Just a little, you know, a little, a little word here. And we fly off the handle in a tirade, yelling and screaming and just tearing the home apart. Our family members, the ones closest to us, they live in fear of our emotional tirades. The husband would rather stay at work. The wife cries herself to sleep at night. The kids don't want to come home from school. Even the dog hides from you. Come on, some of you know what I'm talking about. Many of us know the ruin that this toxic stew can bring to families, brothers and sisters who have not talked for years. Right? Sons and daughters haven't talked to their parents. Nieces and nephews deprived of their, their uncles. Children deprived of their grandparents. I've done funerals. I've done funerals where brothers and sisters haven't seen or talked to each other for 10 years. And now they're seeing, one is seeing the other for the first time in 10 years at the funeral. Weeping over wasted years. It'll bring death to us relationally. It makes its way into all those relationships. And then it'll bring death to your church. It'll bring death to your church. Do you know most churches do not die because the Christians are fighting the devil? Most churches die because the Christians are fighting each other? The devil cannot destroy a church by direct assault, by blatant attack. This only makes the church stronger. We recognize the enemy's attack externally, and what do we do? We pray, we fast, we seek God. We get stronger, right? But what he does do, and what, he, what he's very successful at in a lot of churches, is he gets Christians within to fight each other. To think that your brother is the enemy, your sister is the enemy, rather than recognizing who the enemy truly is. Jesus said in Mark chapter 3 and elsewhere in the Gospels that a house divided cannot stand. Cannot stand. Usually division in a church, a divided church, usually that division can be traced backward. If you follow it backward, if you reverse engineer it, it'll be traced back to one or two people in the church who are eating from deadly stew. 
They're miserable. They're contentious. You know, some people, they, they are more comfortable in the midst of fighting and division and arguing because of the way that they were raised. They have a contentious, angry spirit. And so they want to take the environment and they want to turn that into a contentious and angry environment. And many churches, you can trace the division back to someone who's angry and contentious, who got into a position of leadership or influence, and they're using that influence to turn the environment, the atmosphere of that church, to conform it into what they feel internally, because that's where they feel most comfortable. So it'll be death to the church. And it'll be a death to us physically, physically as well. To, to a greater measure than many of us realize, our physical health is affected by this bitter stew that we're, that we're eating in. One doctor wrote this. The quote is up there on the screen. It is a known fact. Many of the illnesses which doctors are treating today are psychosomatic. In other words, physical disorders of the body originating in or aggravated by the emotional processes of the mind. They're physical illnesses to be sure, but they spring forth from unresolved emotional conflicts in the patient's lives. Emotional stress can trigger all, trigger all kinds of physical problems, high blood pressure, migraine headaches, bleeding ulcers, heart and respiratory failure, or a terrible case of colitis, can be side effects of uncontrolled emotional stress. Some people are praying for physical healing, but they never receive that physical healing from the Lord. Why? Because the problem is not physical. The problem is they're eating from deadly stew. And if you have bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart, and it's eating away at your soul, and you have anxiety and stress that's eating away at your physical body because of it, don't expect to receive a miraculous healing when the issue is not physical the issue, the issue is the bitterness that you keep eating and drinking in again and again. How many are tracking with me this morning? Amen? I mean, really, how can we be healed of heart failure and migraines if resentment and anger is the root cause of it? Amen? Right? You can come here and get prayed for and heal a, a migraine, but that's not the root cause. It's not just I need a physical touch. The root cause is all these unresolved conflicts that you've not brought to the Lord and allowed Him to heal you. So what do we do? What do we do when someone has come to the table and thrown bitter herbs into the stew? Well, we need to do the same thing that Elijah did. Verse 41 says that he added some flour, some meal to the pot. In other words, we can't remove what was done to us. We can't pretend it away. We can't just deny that it, that it happened, right? It's, it's there. It's a part of us. It's, it's in our mind. It's in our history. It's a part of our life right now. It's a part of who we are. It's, it's actually helped to kind of form our character and our, and our personality to this moment. So it's not like God just removes it like it, it never happened, right? But there are some things that the Word of God says we can add to the deadly stew, add back into the table of our life to neutralize the effects of that poison and get victory over it. Amen. Hallelujah. First of all, we need to add forgiveness. Everybody say forgiveness. It's easy to say, isn't it? <laughs> it's hard to do. But you know, forgiveness is not an event, it's a process. Right? We, don't just, we don't just declare, I forgive you to someone, or even in our heart. We don't just recite that in our heart towards someone, and then the offense is gone and the anger is gone. No, it's, it's just the beginning of the process. Forgiveness is a discipline. Forgiveness is a practice. It's something that we need to return to regularly until we get victory over the grudge that is seated in our heart towards that person. It's a process. Amen? Come on, some of you know what I'm talking about because you've done the hard work of forgiveness. I know some of you, and I know your histories, and I know what some of you have been through, some really hard situations, and you've had to do the work, the hard work of forgiveness, and it's hard work. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. Yeah, come on, I know some of you know what that work is. It's not a one-time event. It's a process. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with one another and forgive one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. 
So the Greek word for forgive means literally to release. To release, to roll away. Like, like with a debt, to release a debt, to, to roll away that sense that you have towards someone that they owe you something. Right? We call it a grudge. Right? And some of us are holding a person under a grudge. We're holding a person in a place of resentment until that person pays back what we feel they owe us. Some apology or some acknowledgement of wrong or some admission of, well, you, you were right and I was wrong. And so we're, we're holding a feeling of bitterness or anger toward that person until they pay us back what they owe. But forgiveness is to release them from that debt. It's to release them. And it's to say basically in your heart that the quality of my life is not dependent on receiving an apology from someone. I don't need someone's apology to feel better about myself or to feel good about my life. It means that you're going to stop allowing that person to have control over you. Amen. <laughs> Do you know what a victim is? A victim is someone who is held under the power of past offenses. If something happened to you a long time ago, but you're still held under the power of what happened to you. It still torments you. It still plagues you. You're still drinking in that bitter stew. And don't think, see, here's what we think. We think that because we're holding that person in resentment, that somehow we're hurting them. That somehow we're punishing them, right? We're afflicting them secretly in our heart because we have this resentment against them. But listen, you're not hurting them. Just the opposite is happening. You're empowering them. You're giving them power over you. But I'm here to tell you today, it's time to evict that person from your mind, right? To evict the power, to evict them. Listen, unforgiveness, it's been said, unforgiveness is the poison we drink while waiting for the other person to die. The other person's not going to die. It's killing us. There's death in the pot. So we need to release that person from the debt that we think they owe. Just release them from it. Say, I don't need, I'm not looking for an apology. I don't want an apology. I don't need you to give me anything to feel better about myself because I'm not giving you power over me anymore. I let you go. Amen? Yes? And then we must add repentance. So we need to add forgiveness and we need to add repentance. First, repent before God. Because let's face it, unforgiveness is offensive to God. It is a sin to God. In fact, Jesus said this in Mark 11, If you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Those are some powerful words, amen? I mean, talk about incentive to try to work through forgiveness, yes? Right? If you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. See, here's the thing. God, hasn't God forgiven you for a lot? I mean, come on, seriously. Amen? Amen. How many understand that every day, every day, the Bible says that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you? Every day, every second of the day, Jesus is saying, Father, forgive him. No, forgive him, Father, the blood, forgive him. For, again, forgive him, right? Amen? And you haven't even gotten out of bed yet. So our relationship with God is continually dependent on this dynamic of forgiveness that Jesus paid for on the cross, right? And it is offensive to God because he's forgiven us of so much that we refuse to give others for how they've offended us. That's offensive to God, right? So if we want to be fully set free of that deadly stew, if we want to be fully healed of that bitterness and that offense, right, we've got to say, God, forgive me. Start there. Amen, church. We've got to start there. To acknowledge before God, I, I, I'm holding on to a grudge. I'm holding on to unforgiveness. Lord, forgive me for my unforgiveness, Lord, and help me to work through this process of forgiving. Yes? Acts 3.19, repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. How many want some refreshing from the Lord, right? Amen? Forgive me, Lord. Second, as far as repentance goes, 
Sometimes we need to repent to those who have eaten our deadly stew. You see, most people don't like to eat alone. They like to share their deadly stew with others. <laughs> right? They like to make other people toxic as well. Like Job's wife, right? She said to her husband, you're keeping your integrity? Curse God and die. Why would she do that? Because people who are cursing God in their hearts are only happy when everyone else around them is cursing God as well. I mean, you know, that's, that's saying misery loves. What is it? Misery loves? Misery loves company. And miserable, miserable people want to invite you to their table of miserableness and spoon feed you their deadly stew. Amen. So have you been feeding others your deadly stew? Hebrews 12, 15 says that bitterness defiles many. It is a poison that affects everyone around us. Bitterness defiles. It doesn't just stay in our own heart. It always has the effect on the people around us. We can't help it. We can't help it. And some of us have been feeding our friends. We've been feeding our coworkers. We've been feeding our brothers and sisters in church. We've been feeding our children our deadly stew. Do you know that many parents are teaching their children how to walk in bitterness and resentment and un un unforgiveness? We're teaching our children how to hold grudges. And some of us may need to go back to those people that we've poisoned and repent. We need to go back to our, maybe to our spouse and heal old wounds. Or maybe we need to go back to our friends and our co-workers and, and confess to them, you know, I said some things yesterday that really were, were inappropriate and I, I want to repent of that and tell you that I'm sorry. Maybe we need to go back to our children and dig up some bad seeds that we planted in the soils of their lives. Amen? said some things about people, acted out in a way and go back to our children and learn how to apologize to them and learn how to correct those things that we've done that were wrong. Amen? Hello? Yes? So repentance. So forgiveness and repentance. And then thirdly, and this is the last thing and we're going to close. The last thing that we need to add to that stew, that deadly stew, is faith in God. Our trust in God. Get to the place where we stop blaming God and we're angry at God and we're mad at God, right? And mad at everyone for what they did to us, right? And, and, and listen, I know God can handle our anger and God can, you know, we can ask God why and God can handle it and that's fine. That's fine for, for a little bit. Everybody say a little bit. But you can't live there. You've got to get to a point where you move beyond blaming God, accusing God, and questioning God. You've got to move beyond that and get to a point where you can trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. You've got to get to that place where your ability to trust Him is not dependent on your ability to understand Him and get an explanation from Him. Where you can simply say, Lord, I don't know why. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't know what is going to happen. But Lord, I know this, that you are good. You are good in my life. And that, Lord, you cause all things to work together for the good. And that, Lord, you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it around and you use it for good. Even these wild gourds that have been thrown into the good table you've prepared for me, Lord, I know that you can take these wild gourds on this good table and that, Lord, you can take it and you can use it for your glory, Lord, and for my benefit. So, Lord, I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to stop shaking my fist at you. I'm going to stop challenging you. I'm going to stop questioning you. I'm going to stop venting towards you. And I'm going to start to humble myself before you and acknowledge that you are God and that you are sovereign, that you are master, and that I trust in you. We love that. We love that scripture, that statement that God takes what the enemy meant for evil and uses it for good. You know where that came from? It came from Joseph. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. He was sold into slavery. He was abandoned in prison and forgotten about there for year after year. And then after God delivered him out of prison and God promoted him to be second in command over all of Egypt, he realized that 
What his brothers did to him so many years ago, they meant for evil. But God was working in that situation to move him into Egypt to be able to elevate him to second in command so that he could be a source of blessing and safety and stability and prosperity for his family there in Goshen, in the land of Goshen. Right? So Joseph got to a point where he said, God, you were in control the whole time. The key is, not to eat the deadly stew, but to bring it to God. Amen? To add the forgiveness, to add the repentance, to add the faith, and allow the Holy Spirit to neutralize the effects of that poison in our lives. Let me ask the worship team to join me up here. So, Father, we're thankful, God, for the, the good table, Lord, that you have prepared for us, God, even in the presence of our enemy. It's a good table, God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for that good table. Come on, if you're thankful for the good table, stand to your feet right now. and Just lift your hand and say, thank you, Lord, that good table that you've given me. Come on, forget about all the negative and all the bad right now and how somebody's thrown a lap full of wild gourds onto your... And now just thank God for the good table. Lord, there's so many good things, God, that I need to thank you for right now. I thank you, Lord God for my health. I thank you, Lord God, for my children's health. I thank you, Lord God, that we have a roof over our head and, and we got a car to drive and we've got a job, Lord God, where we can bring home, Lord, financial resources. And uh, Lord, we thank you for our, Lord, for our health care. Lord, we thank you for being born in, in the United States. We thank, there's so much, God, to be thankful for. You've prepared a good table for us in the presence of the enemy. Our cup runs over, hallelujah. Come on, is your cup running over right now? Our cup runs over, Lord, and we thank you for that, oh God. There are people all around the world, Lord God, who are just wishing they could have what we have. And we thank you, God, because you've given it to us. Oh God, my cup runs over, and I thank you, Lord God. But Lord, there are those times where that enemy comes, sends someone to the table with a lap full of wild gourds, and throws it into the stew. Lord, help us to recognize the subtle strategies of the enemy meant to destroy us. Lord, help me to forgive those that I need to forgive. Come on, just to, to say that to the Lord. Lord, help me, God, to forgive. Help me to forgive, God. Because, Lord, I repent. I repent, Lord God, of holding on to anger and resentment towards that person, Lord. And I, and I release that person. I release that person, Lord, and I repent, God, of offending you with my unforgiveness. And Lord, I'm going to trust you. Hallelujah. I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm going to trust you, Lord God, that I'm not a victim of circumstance, that my life is not spiraling out of control, but that, Lord, you are sovereign, and you're going to take this season that I'm in, and you're going to use it, Lord God. Come on, some of you need to do that right now. You're in a season, it's hard. There's division in your family, division in your life. There's, 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 there's a poison in you, but you need to be able to say, Lord, I believe you're going to take this season and you're going to use it, God. And I'm going to worship you in it. I'm going to trust you, Lord. Thank you for tuning into our service today. We're so thankful that you were able to join us. We pray that you're able to join us in person here on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock and 1045 every Sunday. We also have amazing children's programs here in the building of Sunday mornings for both services as well. Wednesday nights, seven o'clock here in the building, we've got amazing children's programs. And then Friday nights from seven to nine o'clock, we have our youth programs. If you want to keep up to date with everything going on, please check out our social medias as well as follow everything on our website at missionchurch.com. God bless you and we'll see you around.